Hey again, this is lecture three of module one, The Writer Prepares, and it is entitled Getting Started in Three Parts. In this lecture, we're going to discuss how we're going to bring along your story and your characters at the same time. So you can't write a complete story without knowing all about your characters. And you can't flesh out your characters until you know the complete story. So we're going to work in this module to bring them both forward together simultaneously. Finally, after all those boring lectures, let's get down to some writing. Hopefully you're taking this workshop with a story in mind that you'd like to tell. If not, please pause the video right now, go sit somewhere quiet and think of a story that you'd like to tell because you're going to be able to use all the information in this lecture to begin building your story right away. We're going to start off by determining the subject of your story. What's your story about? All that begins with a single sentence. You're going to want a TV guide style, one single sentence, something you'd see maybe in a Netflix description that is a single sentence synopsis encapsulating your whole story. For example, a young boy gets more than he bargained for in a grown-up world when he makes an enchanted wish to be big. Now, that sentence right there describes the overall story of the film, Big, starring Tom Hanks. It's been said that the hardest thing to do is to face a blank sheet of paper, and it's pretty daunting. To me, the second hardest thing to do is to write with restraint. You must have all of these ideas running around in your head, ready to burst out your fingertips right now. Well, fight the urge. Let's start building your story. What are you going to write about? Grab a pad of paper and a pen and write one sentence that encapsulates your entire story. You can use a word processor like Word, but I prefer an old-fashioned pad and paper. It's just something about the texture. Don't try to write an entire script all at once right now. Just start with one sentence. Start with something that you may see on Netflix in the description and try to encompass your entire story within that single sentence. Now go ahead and write that single sentence down. You got it? Okay. All right. Once you have a sentence you like, then begin building around that sentence. For example, like we said before, a young boy gets more than he bargained for in a grown-up world when he makes an enchanted wish to be big. With the help of his friends, he discovers the value of his youth and decides that being a grown-up can wait. Adding one extra sentence or two will help you dial in a more precise vision of your story while keeping the focus on your subject. Now, this is an organic process of discovery. Go ahead and try adding a second sentence to your first sentence right now. And I'll wait, or you can pause the video. As you add sentences to your paragraph, you may suddenly feel like the story is going in the wrong direction. Well, that's all right. You might end up going all the way back to the beginning and rewriting your initial sentence again once you've fleshed out your idea a little more. That's perfectly okay, too. It's an idea-building exercise. It's an organic process. Let it flow. You have a word processing program for a reason. You don't have to go back and scratch out a bunch of lines. You're not having to go back and, and white out and cover things up. And so it's okay to have ever-changing ideas or an evolving idea process. If you feel your story is going askew while you're writing, just stop. Walk away and come back to it tomorrow. Writing frustrated is not a good idea because frustration chokes creativity more often than not. Now that you have a couple of sentences or more written in your first paragraph, let's go back to the story paradigm and take a look at it in regard to building your story. You only have three acts to tell your story in a screenplay form. Remember, a novelist can be ander around. He can take five pages to ramble about the morning bells at Notre Dame. But much like Twitter, a screenplay must be very constrained. You only have 120 pages or so at the most to tell your story. And if this is your first screenplay, in today's marketplace, 100 to 110 pages constitute uh, a good length for an independent project, but 120 is more for studio. In fact, most agents won't even look at scripts that are over 120 pages or so because it tells them right then and there, you don't know what you're doing, and they're not going to waste their time. Because a screenplay has a limited structure, you must know where the story is going from the start and get there efficiently. Know the end of your story before you begin to really write in earnest. Be sure to be specific. For example, writing the hero wins really doesn't give you much of a direction to go into. I want something definitive, like Iron Man snaps his fingers using the Infinity Stones to eliminate Thanos and his minions. 
What you're trying to do is navigate from point A to point B, point B being the end of your story. If you don't know the end, how are you going to write your way there? It's almost like saying, well, I'm going to go on vacation. Well, good. Where are you going? Well, I don't know. We're going to just drive around until we see something interesting. You will waste a lot of time and energy and get nothing valuable accomplished. And if you're wasting time and energy, you're going to get frustrated. And frustration chokes creativity. Know where you're going and then write your way there. A story paradigm gives you a visual representation of your story and allows the writer to plug in different aspects of the story to get a feeling for his or her structure without writing and rewriting whole pages. Break down your story so the important aspects fit into the points on your paradigm. You can see where the setup is, the conflict starts and stops, and the resolution begins. Even if you're writing a nonfiction script, so many variables can make a paradigm very challenging, but that's okay. It's like putting together a puzzle. Just grab the pieces and then discover where they fit. Remember, you're putting together building blocks, moving from a single sentence and traveling toward a goal of a 120 page screenplay. Okay, now what you're looking at right here in this slide is a story paradigm that I created for an actual screenplay I wrote for a project that I hope to produce one day myself. And as you can see, it begins with page one, where the main character, our hero Callie, appears on camera giving her final news report. Then on page 29, we have a special agent from the FBI, SSA Jacoby, who shows up. On page 30, Callie realizes something is afoot. Oh, the story, by the way, is a political thriller. On page 60, special agent uh, Jacoby realizes that there is in fact something going on and he decides to help Callie, or so it seems. On page 89, which is the second plot point, Callie feels like the puzzle is just about put together. But on page 90, Jacoby is blown up and apparently killed. So that just throws her whole world into a tailspin. By the end of the screenplay, on page 120, she now has to solve things on her own, or so it seems. As we continue adding sentences, our story is underway. Now we will begin looking at characters. We determine our main character by answering the question, whose story is it? Who changes? Or who changes the most? If no one changes, then your story is pretty pointless. Now, there are stories where our main character doesn't seem to change, such as leaving Las Vegas. Nicolas Cage's character's refusal to change his alcoholic death spiral is central to the conflict. And remember, the conflict takes up to 50% of your script. The setup is only 25%. The resolution is only 25%. Most of your script is taken up by the conflict, also known as the confrontation. So somebody needs to change. When building your story, the paragraph grows into a page. This is a simple progression from one paragraph to two to a full page. Here's where your paradigm also becomes more important. Use your paradigm as a tool to suggest story elements that you will incorporate into your narrative or story that you are creating. This is another organic process. As you write, you may go through several iterations before you settle on a direction you like. If you're struggling, remember, don't fight it. Walk away and come back with a fresh perspective either later that day or the next day. Frustration chokes creativity. In discussing characters, the art of fiction author Henry James wrote, what is character but the determination of incident? And what is incident but the illustration of character? Incident is defined as a specific occurrence or event that occurs in connection or relationship with something else. Screenplays usually revolve around some sort of an incident. That incident can be physical, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, perhaps even sexual. That then makes the conflict fall within the context of a physical conflict like Rocky. An emotional conflict is found in terms of endearment. Spiritual conflict like Agnes of God. Or an intellectual conflict like A Beautiful Mind. Or perhaps even a sexual conflict like American Gigolo. Uh, which are all classic man versus man, man versus nature, or man versus himself story. And now thanks to technology, you can actually uh, go through man versus machine like The Terminator or War Games. So who are the main characters of your story? You must use only as many characters as are needed to illuminate or expose the character or tendencies of your lead actor. The purpose of supporting characters in your screenplay is to drive the story forward through their interaction with the main character. In the supporting characters' interactions with the main character during each incident, 
Something should be revealed about your main actor's character, something about their person. Uh, an example of this is in the film Rocky. Mick, Rocky's trainer, spends much of his dialogue exposing Rocky to the audience in the form of motivational rants. Using supporting characters' interactions, you can expose the main character's past, innermost thoughts, certain proclivities, etc. As you continue to write your story, each of these drives the story forward by setting up future events. Your story should be told with great efficiency and great economy. Use only as many characters as are needed to tell your audience everything they need to know about your main character. Put too many characters in your script and you're going to begin to confuse your audience. A screenplay structure demands economy. Often in a work of nonfiction, certain characters are amalgamated into a single character for the sake of efficiency. In the film JFK, for example, director Oliver Stone used Donald Sutherland's character as an amalgam of multiple people that were providing information instead of building five different characters that could confuse the audience in an already long screenplay. He chose to put all that information into the character played by Donald Sutherland, who was an amalgam of multiple characters, many put into a single character for efficiency's sake. Now, going back to structure and character, as you create characters, begin placing them in your story paradigm. If your secondary characters don't fit comfortably somewhere in your setup or somewhere in your conflict, they should not be in your script. Write with great economy, meaning only write characters that are necessary. If they don't fit comfortably into your paradigm, don't put them into your story. It takes discipline. First-time screenwriters often want to add characters to their story because they're cool or eccentric or whatever. Hey, look, it's your screenplay, write what you want. But if you are serious about writing an amazing story on paper, discipline yourself. Keep your screenplay as a lean, mean storytelling machine. Use only the number of characters necessary to tell your complete story. Now, let's talk about the qualities of characters. Now, there are four essential qualities that every three-dimensional character must have. Without all four, characters are really nothing more than a prop. You must put all four of these essential qualities into the main characters of your story. Number one, they have to have a strong and defined dramatic need. The audience must see what the character's true motivation is. In The Avengers Rise of Ultron, Tony Stark wanted to, quote, put a suit of armor around the world. That was his dramatic need. Number two, they must have an individual point of view. In Lawrence of Arabia, Sir Lawrence thought that the Arab states would become a great nation independent of British rule, even though he himself was a British soldier. Number three, they must personify an attitude. In Open Range, Charlie Postlewaite personified the cowboy life. And number four, they must go through some kind of change. In Forrest Gump, for example, Lieutenant Dan hates his life as a wounded warrior from Vietnam, but he learns to heal and embrace his life so much so that he takes a Vietnamese bride. So story versus character, which comes first? As you create your main character and fit him or her into your story, know that there are two basic approaches to writing a character-driven fictional script. The first is to develop a scenario, then pour your character into that scenario. In Dances with Wolves, for example, Lieutenant Dunbar was poured into a post-Civil War American frontier world. That would be considered a scenario-driven approach. The other is to develop a character and then build scenarios or obstacles around him or her. Ethan Hunt, for example, leads a Mission Impossible team into a wide array of dangerous and subversive scenarios. The character of the man never changes, but he grows through his travails. And that would be considered a character-based approach. Either one is just as valid as the other. In these approaches, however, your main character should still hold all four of those essential qualities. Now, in an earlier lecture, I mentioned content versus context. Simply defined, content is what happens, and context is the environment in which it happens. It's easiest to think of it like this. Content is cereal and milk. Context is the cereal bowl. If you're telling a fictitious story, you have two important choices to make. First, determine your content. For example, a man struggling at war with himself is content then put that into a specific context. The man struggling at war with himself lives in a nation at war with itself. And whether you know it or not, uh, just describe the content and context of Dances with Wolves. 
and to some degree, The Last Samurai and Avatar. What you want to do as you develop your story is find which context most effectively illuminates your content. In this case, the content is used as a metaphor. A nation at war with itself, the American Civil War, is a metaphor for the man at war with himself, Lieutenant John Dunbar in Dances with Wolves. Determine a context that most effectively holds your content and then begin to build your world from there. For example, Dances with Wolves, The Last Samurai, and Avatar are all similar in content, a man at war with himself. But the different contexts of the American Civil War, the Japanese Civil War, and the intergalactic war between the Earthlings and the Pandorans, the Navi, allow for nuances in the story and the details of each of those respectively. So let's review. Your main character is the person in your story who changes or changes the most. You inform your audience about the various attributes of your main character by adding secondary characters to expose the different aspects of their life. There are four essential qualities that every three-dimensional character must have. They have to have a strong and defined dramatic need. They have to have an individual point of view. They need to personify an attitude, and they must go through some kind of change. Okay, here comes our long-awaited writing exercises. As we end part one of this lecture, the first thing I want you to do is write about your main character in terms of the four essential character qualities. Number one, what is their dramatic need? Number two, what is their point of view? Number three, what attitude do they personify? And number four, what change do they go through? Second, what secondary characters are you going to use to point out those qualities? Is it an old romantic relationship or a lifelong friend or a recent confidant? Make your choice and prepare to defend the reason you made that choice. Third, based on the choices you've made, I now want you to put them into a story content and context that works best with and against those qualities that you've given your characters. Yes, I said with and against those qualities because that pro and con gives depth and reality to your conflict. Life isn't always smooth sailing. Take as long as you need to complete this exercise and do not move on to the next part of this lecture until you are completely done. Each step in this process builds on the previous, so it is important that you complete one exercise before moving on. All right, let's get started. Take as long as you need, and I will see you at part two of lecture number three.